<laughs> so, um, without further ado, I think I'll have uh, Jessica come, come up and uh, have her say a word or two about her heart and maybe take some questions from the audience. So, Jessica, please, you, you may use the microphone or not if you can project. I can project. I'm the oldest of four. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll leave that. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I had no idea what to expect because, as I was just saying, we're new in the area, so I don't have my normal <laughs> around the corner people to show up to these sort of things, so I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, I'm going to start with a little sort of brief story about where this work came from for me, and then I'd love some of you have already asked me questions. If anyone has any questions after that comes up, I'd love to hear them. Uh, what I'll start with is, I guess if you'd asked me two years ago what my art practice was, I would have said, we travel, we go places, we take pictures, we come home, journal, let it marinate, and then create art using those photographs. I extract elements from various photographs and then recompose them. So it's reality, but sort of a whimsical twist on reality. So then COVID. <laughs> Obviously, we weren't traveling anymore. Uh, we lived in Toronto at the time. Our house was 600 square feet, and we didn't have a car. <laughs> so the world became really small, and it was basically walking distance from our front door most of the time. Uh, so what we decided to do, we looked at a map, and we looked at where the green spaces were within the radius of what was walkable, uh, and we started exploring the green spaces near us. And we were lucky, luckier than we could have imagined, Toronto's full of ravines, and we hadn't really ever appreciated that because we were so busy going other places. <laughs> so it was, a, it was not the worst place to be stuck walking. Um, so we did a lot of ravine walking, a lot of... Um, creeks and this is Highland Creek, which is in the east end. The Rouge Valley is on that back wall there. Um, and as we walked, we sort of we started off talking about the pandemic, what was happening, how we felt about it, what we read that day, all that kind of thing. And then we started talking about who do you think made those tracks, or whose house do you think that is under that log there, or what kind of bird do you think that is this year? And it was just, it was like this slight shift in, from extreme anxiety and uncertainty to curiosity. And I think almost all art starts with curiosity. And most of you are artists here, right? Would you agree? Huh? <laughs> You're curious about something, so you, you explore it. You want to get to know it. Um, and the, I think that conversation is what creates art between the artist and the subject that you're curious about. Um, so in making this work, I wanted it to feel like a safe place at a time when it didn't feel like the world was a safe place. When we were at home, I wanted vines growing down the walls, I wanted moss under my feet, I wanted trees growing up in the middle of the living room. Um, and we, as I said, we spent most of our days out walking, walking uh, in all these beautiful places, and that was kind of mentally how how we filled our heads with greenery and with life. And then, I think we all thought the lockdowns were going to be a lot briefer, and then it became apparent this is going to be all winter. Winter is going to be dark, depressing, you know, possibly really boring. Um, so what I wanted then was to create work that would fill all the views in our living room. Our living room was smaller than this room here. It would have taken up all the wall space, <laughs> these pieces. Um, and I wanted it to feel like if you were in the living room, that you were in the setting rather than looking at a piece of work on the wall. Um, and that's why I included chairs. These are all our chairs from home that you see in the pieces and in the gallery around you. Um, I really wanted to blur the lines between the natural world outside, the domestic world that we were sort of trapped in, and at the same time felt safe in. Um, and then here, now that we're in the gallery, 
to bring the chairs and the birch branches into the gallery as well. I like the idea of blurring the line between what's in the piece and what's in the gallery and what's in reality. And being able to create, it's almost like a meditation. I don't know if any of you meditate, but if you meditate, you can create a safe space in your mind and you can go there. And that's what I wanted these to be. That you could just go and sit in that chair, or this chair, or that chair, any of them, and you could feel safe and you could listen to the birds, um, watch squirrels run around, any of that kind of stuff. So that's where it came from for me. Um, oh yes, the audio track is a layering of two different recordings, one of which were birds. I was sitting on my front porch in Toronto recording those birds. This was two years ago roughly now. So to be able to sit on your front porch in Toronto and record audio and just hear birds was un <laughs> unheard of before that. But all of a sudden there was no traffic, there was no construction, there was no air traffic even. It was, all you heard was birds sitting on the porch and it was sort of, I mean, we had a family of foxes down on the beach. It was like the most magical Toronto's ever been, <laughs> I think. Um, and the, the other layer of the audio is wind chimes. And that's from our new home. One of the first things, we moved to a property um, about an hour and a half northeast of here, near Killaloo. And it's 42 acres. It's a lot bigger than 600 square feet. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a project property. We wanted to have things that we could dig into and build and create uh, and share. And one of the first things that my husband did when we got there is he reopened up the path through the forest that hadn't been used in about 15 years. And at the entry to that path, he built an arch and put wind chimes. So as you go through, you kind of hit the thing for the wind chimes, and the wind chimes go off. <laughs> I'm sure the deer love it too. <laughs> uh, and then the birch branches, a quick note about the birch branches, they are also from our forest. This birch tree fell down in a windstorm in November, and we've been, it was quite close to the path, so we've been walking past it for months, and watching the little tips get shorter and shorter as the deer ate them. <laughs> and then Norman set up trail cams near there, so we actually have footage of the deer eating the ends of the, the branches. Um, anyway, it felt like a nice addition to sort of bring a bit of the forest here as well, and they're beautiful. So, and as Lila said, it's a nice tribute to this tree that has a, uh, I mean now it'll be firewood after, but this is a nice place for it to come in the <laughs> Um So I think that's the thing. Yes. I have another question. <laughs> um, so the composite nature of the photograph. So how many of how many photographic images might go into creating the That's finished product? That's an excellent question. Um, this piece. Can I the right of the <laughs> this piece here. Uh, the original. This was Taylor Creek, which is in the east end of Toronto. So the, the forest itself, all the branches that you see, that was Taylor Creek. This sort of gold part was a vine that was growing in Monet's garden. Um, I went there in October of 2019. It's the last, last trip we did before the pandemic um, was to France and I did an artist residency and visited Monet's garden, so that's from there. And then what made it gold, though, like in real life that was red, bright, bright red. The gold layer is a piece of gold um, cork that I have. It's just like a paper, sort of. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. I just thought it would make a nice addition, the color of that, the length of it. The chair is its own layer. And this is an avocado tree that Norman planted early in the pandemic. It has since passed on. <laughs> so the, so the, the chair would actually be an add-on? Yes. Okay. The chair, I took it in front of our house. Uh-huh. Um, the, the photograph of the chair. All the chairs I photographed it in front of our house because mainly I could control the light there. Right. I could wait until the right time of day. Uh -huh. and it, I would never carry chairs through right. the ravine and made it back out. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and there is some lovely, like, yeah. and, like yeah. shadow. I wanted it to feel uh, um, hopeful, you know, a nice, uh -huh. sunny, cozy spot. 
This greenery down here is a separate layer. Okay. And then the background, how it's green in the sky, is a crystal. I believe it's a piece of malachite. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's I am. a beautiful, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful stone. Yeah. Um, and it symbolizes positive transformation, mm -hmm. which I also. A lot of them have, possibly all of them have crystals as the sky layer, and malachite's one of my favorites because of that, um, the tie-in, the intent. Yes, green is obviously your color. It's, <laughs> it's a favorite. Yes. <laughs> oh, me yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and the little firefly layer. Mm -hmm. That was Christmas lights. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed this, but at Christmas time, if you have your Christmas tree in the same room as the TV, if the TV's turned off and the Christmas lights are on, they reflect in the TV right. and it looks yes. like mm -hmm. it's a portal to another world or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where, <laughs> that's where oh, that is. Is from. Interesting. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. So do they all have, um, like this one? Now I want you to explain the layers of every one, which may not be feasible, but... Well, so. it's, there are patterns, right? So this one also has a crystal in the background. It's just wow. a different crystal, and I can't remember, unfortunately, what it's called. But, um, and it was a grounding one. That was, the perp that was the purpose behind that crystal. These little fireflies are the same christmas like layer. Uh, this layer here, we went uh, snorkeling in Mexico. They have these um, cenotes, they're called. It's basically uh, like sinkholes full of water. Um, and they're ecologically, I think, unique compared to other stuff that would be, you know, like a lake or the ocean or whatever. Um, and this one had, they were like lily pads, but they were only underwater. They were only about, I'm going to say maybe three feet off the bottom of the water and another five feet of water above them. Um, wow. And it was a rainy day. We were the only ones at this one because it was, you know, I mean, for Mexico, it was miserable weather. <laughs> but it was beautiful. You get beautiful light in the rain. Um, and then the chair. And this, this layer here, you might have to come closer to see. It's sort of more of a texture. And this, this color where it repeats, mm -hmm. that was coral. That was also a smoke one. So there's so many elements that you bring into yeah. these pieces. <laughs> wow. How many layers typically? Um, I would say that this series, it, it probably is more than I used to do. I think they probably are around six or seven image layers. But as far as actual layers, there's probably 30-ish. Because then you've got adjustment layers in it. But it's yeah, it's a lot of I've had to learn to label my things very <laughs> concisely so that I can figure out if I want to go back and make one small change and yeah, people find what, you, <laughs> what that layer how, was and where it came from. <laughs> I was saying how often you edit the wrong layer. Oh, sometimes that is the best thing ever though. I That's how I get happy accidents. <laughs> yeah, I've had times where it's I'll do. Um, I'll brighten something that I didn't intend to brighten, and it changes everything, and I love it, so it stays. So you were explaining to Barb, so I'll ask the question that she asked. Sure. You said that you, you print this on watercolor paper, and then how, how do you... I'll be honest, I don't print it. I have a guy who does the printing. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a really big printer. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, very, with very nice ink. Yeah, so it's our handle ink onto watercolor paper, uh, and then I hand distress the edges. So I round the corners of all of them, and just sort of give them this softness at the edge. Um, the reason I like to do that is to make it feel like it's not new, like it's lived in, like it's organic, like it has a human touch, I guess. It's a bit of warmth. Um, when I was growing up, if your parents took pictures, they took them to the drugstore to get them developed, you got proofs back, and they had rounded corners. So to me, the rounded corners are, are immediately childhood memories or something more um, simpler times. <laughs> um, and then the panels, 
are not solid, as you know, because you hung them, but it's not necessarily obvious. The panels, this is a birch plywood on a basswood frame, so they aren't as heavy as they look. They get mounted onto the panels, and then I do three coats of a satin artist UV varnish so that they are protected from sunlight, fading, all that kind of stuff. Ambient moisture. Um, like you couldn't hang it inside, but it's okay. I had, in our old house, I had one, a fairly large piece in our very small washroom for years, and it was fine. So, so, the, so the, manipulation, <laughs> the manipulation you would do when you're adding the layers and so on, is that at that scale, or are you working on a smaller scale before? That's my question. Yeah, when I compose, I compose in a 4 by 6 size, because uh, you can work a lot quicker. And it's not gonna because when I'm working in this size, every change I make, I've got to sit there and wait for the change to actually apply. And to compose, you would never have the patience. I would never have the patience <laughs> to, to do that. So when I yeah, when I compose it, I do small versions to just see if it's gonna work. Yeah. Uh, and then I go back and and process much larger files of those source. You know, seven images. Let's say. Um, or if it's something like the chair, then I could really crop it close on the chair and not have all that extra uh, data that you don't really need. Mm -hmm. um, so then I would, each layer, I, I, I do, I extricate it from its picture and sort of save that as its own file, if that makes sense, and then combine all the files and, and put whatever adjustments are going to go on them. So that it hopefully matches up with the 4x6 version. <laughs> I picture the 4x6 version being like for painters when they go on a hike and they just do a quick sketch, like a watercolor sketch or a charcoal sketch or something, so that they can grab the, the essence. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes meaning and sometimes not. Sometimes it's just just to be compositionally interesting, and sometimes, like with the crystals in the background, I do have a, an intent that I want to kind of. Into the piece, yeah, they they feel like they have depth to them. Mm. They're more three dimensional than just a flat photograph. Thank you. Did it's you interesting want to too when you play with scale. Mm -hmm. What happens to um, like these in real life are about that big, but then when you go and make them, you know, the size of the chair or whatever, it's that's not a very dramatic example. The crystal, the crystal that's taking up the whole sky is only that big. So it's over the years it's been interesting for me to see grown-up minds work the puzzle as they're looking at it. Kids have no problem. <laughs> Kids have these these very malleable minds still, right? They look at it and they're like, oh yeah, it's this, it's water in the sky, that's no big deal, or whatever. Because that's still how they're picturing things when they color or make art. And I think for grown-ups it's a nice um, it's a nice process for your for your brain to be challenged that way about reality in a photograph. Um, yeah. Did you want to say anything about uh, options for getting smaller images of the bigger things? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I would forget. Um, these ones, because they are so big, I do appreciate that everybody doesn't have necessarily the size on their wall or the budget for that size. We have two smaller sizes, and it's all listed on the tag. So there's this size. Um, in all honesty, with the supply chain, I hate to say it, with the supply chain, these big ones are potentially the only big ones I'm going to be able to make for quite a while, just because of what I need <laughs> to make them. Um, whereas the smaller ones I can order. Uh, so <laughs> I don't. That hadn't occurred to me. That never happened before until this. But anyway. Panels are on back order now. So, but that being said, I am doing pre-orders for the smaller sizes. I think it's 60 by 40 and 36 by 48. I think for the two smaller sizes. There's my four, so it's a slightly different prop. 48 by yeah, 36. Okay. It's a slightly different prop, and if anyone were interested, they can email me, and I can send them exactly what it would look like um, in either size. So. So many questions. <laughs> do um, do you have a are there crystals in the sort of background of all of these? That one things? has malachite as well. That one's the best image of what malachite raw looks like. See how it's bubbly? Oh wow! And it's it's almost the texture on it is almost like a very fine felt 
sort of texture. It's green in real life. It's, it's this beautiful green. Um, and it's toxic, apparently, to touch. So you have to like wash your hands after you touch it. I don't know, because I have a yeah. slab. No, it, it's time. copper. Hmm. Copper can be toxic if ingested. So don't lick it or, hey, exactly. <laughs> or rub your eyes or something. Yeah. So do you start with that as a backdrop and then layer on mm. there? Or? I think in almost all of these, I'm going to say in all of these, I started with the forest or the ravine as the, as the composition. And then what do I want to, like in, in none of these images was the sky interesting at all in real life. <laughs> so, so I knew right away I wanted to get rid of the sky and make it more dramatic. Um, and then, and then it was just a matter of sort of like, where is the chair going to go once I decided which piece was going to have a chair? And then what do I want to put as far as texture or color? This green one at the end, I don't know if you can see it from here, but it has bubbles. And it looks like they're just sort of flowing through the air. I was underwater there as well. Oh, wow. Um, I'm actually quite scared of being underwater, but once you're underwater, it's, it's almost distracting how beautiful everything is and how different everything is. So it's, it sort of takes you away from the terrifying <laughs> Are you snorkeling or do you Only have snorkeling. Oh, okay. yeah. Norman scuba dives? I don't. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much. They were much. excellent questions. Thank, thank you, you so much for your <laughs>